So I'm going to use my 15 minutes to talk about plant architecture and tell you a little bit about some of the genes and genetic networks that we know about that result in these beautiful um, morphologies that we see outside the building and even inside the building in this particular location. Uh, most of us know that development starts in animals and plants as a single cell. It's usually a fertilized egg, though of course there are always interesting exceptions to any rule. And then within a few divisions, um, polar axes begin. So there's top, bottom, um, anterior, posterior, lateral, medial. And I'll give you uh, a bit of a description about that in this case. Okay, so here we have a dicot, a rabidopsis, and at the bottom, a monocot maze. And you can see a zygote located right here, a single cell. And very quickly, it divides into two, and you have a, a top and a bottom cell. The top cell becomes the embryo. So even at the first cell division, there is an axis determination. And then a few cell divisions later, you have an outside and inside, an epidermis located uh, right here, and internal tissues. And then a few more divisions later, you see a radial or a, a bilateral symmetry. And in animals, most of all the organogenesis occurs during embryology. And so by the time birth occurs, all the parts are there, the legs and wings and limbs. This isn't true in plants. So plants are what I call perpetually embryonic, and that's because of meristems. And because most of you are not plant biologists, I'll spend a few times talking about some of these terms like meristems. On the left, we have a dicot, and on the right, we have a monocot. And there are, they are growing due to meristems. And at the very base of the plant, uh, at, the, at the bottoms of these roots, are root meristems that allow the main root and the lateral roots to spread out. And at the very tippy top, surrounded by leaves, are, uh, is a shoot apical meristem, which is somewhat the focus of my talk. And it's embedded in the leaves that it has just created. Um, in the axils of leaves are axillary meristems with the AB for axillary bud. And these are what make branches. And it's really the axillary meristems that give rise to the different architectures that can be large and branchy or short. So let's look in more detail at meristems. And going from left to right, we have an ivy meristem, and then a, a tomato, and then maize. And there's a word we use called philotaxy, and it describes the pattern of leaf initiation. So you can see that in the ivy and in the tomato, it's a spiral philotaxy with the leaves initiating in a spiral. Whereas in maize, it's an opposite, so um, back and forth zigzag. The letters uh, and numbers stand for P1, P2, P3. These are plastocrons, so each leaf goes through a different state called plastocron. It's kind of like going through being an infant, a child, a, a teenager, an adult, an older person. And so each leaf experiences these different states. And the nice thing about the philotaxy is it allows you to predict where the next leaf will form. And using the ivy as an example, um, there's a space that is marked by zero, and this will be the next leaf, and we can predict it based on the position of the other leaves. So one of the questions that, as a developmental biologist, we ask ourselves is, well, how does a cell know that it's still a stem cell, or how is it knowing that it's a leaf initial cell? And the stem cells I've marked with a red circle here, they're located in the middle, and they continue to divide, and they don't participate in making organs. They replenish all the other cells whereas the cells marked with a green circle are the leaf initial cells, and they'll make the next leaf. And yet, to my eye, they look quite similar. Obviously, they're in different positions, so the cells sense their position. But what other cues do they have about whether they're leaf or stem cell? And an answer to this question came with a dominant mutant that was found in the 20s. Um, I'll tell you more about the mutant phenotype in a minute, and right now talk about why this mutation gave us a clue to that question I posed. The gene is expressed in the meristem, and so this I'm showing you right now is an in situ hybridization, and the meristem in blow up is at that very, very small growing part of the picture that I show to the left of the whole plant, so you can envision that we're looking way inside those leaves. And the blue color is the reflection of the RNA. The protein looks somewhat similar, and you can see that it fills up the space of the meristem, that it's not expressed in leaf two or leaf one, and it's not also in, in position zero where the leaf initials are. So in some ways, you can think of the expression of this gene as marking what is stem cell and what is not stem cell, leaf initial versus meristem. 
And in fitting with that location of expression, when one looks at mutants that don't have the gene, you have a loss of the shoot um, growing tissue and in both Arabidopsis and in maize. And so on the left, we have Arabidopsis, and the far left is a wild type, and you have the cotyledons, the seed leaves, and then two new true leaves forming, whereas the mutant uh, shown here is just making the cotyledons and then no more parts of the shoot form. And that was work of Kathy Barton and Scott Pothig. In maize, in certain inbred backgrounds, it's not true of every maize not a loss of function mutant, the seedling leaves don't grow, and you have arrested growth at this point. You can see their roots, but you are stuck at just making a coleopta, which is a seed leaf. Now, this is not as fun to study, um, something that just stops growing. So the dominant mutants are actually a lot more fun, and I feel somewhat more informative. And this is um, a close-up of that dominant mutant I showed you a few minutes ago. And these are uh, caused by transposon insertions into regulatory regions, and I think the first one was found in 1920 in a cornfield, um, not helping the corn farmer, but because the seeds um, are fertile, they were able to collect it and study it. So let me tell you something about the normal maize leaf. There's an upper distal portion called the blade, an proximal portion called the sheath, and they have very distinct um, phenotypes as well as functions. And again, nodded is not expressed in these cells at all. In the gain of function mutant, uh, in shown here, which is another in C2 now in the leaves, you can see the little coloring, and that's the cells of the vasculature where knotted has come on um, inappropriately. And that expression leads to these interesting phenotypes, and by looking at these with electron micrographs, we see that these cells are now sheath cells. So what knotted has done is transform blade into sheath when it's expressed. It's caused a, a new cell fate, and we also think of it as acquiring a new proximal distal axis. When you turn the gene on into other, um, other tissues, other plants, like putting it into knotted, and we heard an introduction to transgenics, we use those in plants as well, you can see that it has very striking morphology. So the far left is a normal tobacco leaf, and then next to it is a branch where knotted is expressing um, the knotted gene, and the leaves are very, very small, and these plants live forever. They live out of the plastic pots into which they're put. And um, this would, it's not good for cancer because it keeps the tobacco growing without any help from uh, people. And on the surface of these leaves, small shoots are forming, as you can see here. So this is a transgenic. There's also next to it a picture of a barley mutant called hooded, which is a naturally occurring mutant that has uh, meristem coming off the on, and people have used this for, uh, as a forage crop because it, makes, it gives it a little bit more nutrition. One can also dissect leaves by adding knotted in or finding it as a naturally occurring um, expression marker. And on the upper left, we see a wild type Arabidopsis leaf, which is shaped like a spoon. When you express knotted in these leaves, you make it more interesting. It's now dissected into the morphology next to it. We've also found alleles of, uh, in maize where knotted is expressed in a very unique place and causes the leaf to form. Now, tomato is a different case. In tomato, knotted is already on in the leaves, and this is the work of Neela Masinha, a former graduate student, where she found that in, in tomato and other dissected leaves, the Knox genes go off to make a leaf and then come back on to cause these um, very interesting dissected morphologies. And if you add back more doses of knotted, you've turned it into a parsley plant almost, where we have here, um, with extra copies of knotted turned on at high levels, you see a very, very highly dissected leaf. Another example of a naturally occurring dissected leaf that is uh, controlled by Knox genes is shown in the upper corner, the work of Angela Hay and Milto Siantis at Oxford. And in this case, cardamony, which is a small brassica that grows in the wild, is already dissected, and it's dissected because of expression of Knox genes. And when they mutate that gene with an RNAi technology, they create a simple leaf. So the knotted gene is required for the dissected leaf. So to summarize what I told you in a cartoon form, we see in blue that knotted is expressed in the meristem and in yellow that it's not in the incipient leaf initial cells. And that's true for all plants that have been examined. In normal maize leaf primordia, knotted is not on, as shown in yellow. And then as that leaf expands, you end up with a blade sheath orientation that is very rigid in all the grasses and very uh, conserved. When knotted is misexpressed in these leaf uh, primordia cells, it recreates proximal distal patterns such that you have 
blue, dark blue uh, sheath cells in the blade. And then in some dicots, Knox genes come on to cause the dissection of these leaves and create lovely new morphologies. So it's needed for merit stems to continue and it needs to go off to make leaves and it's responsible for a lot of the morphology in, in leaves. So how does a gene do all this? Well, you might have guessed that it's a transcription factor. And so it's binding to promoters, regulatory elements of other genes and turning these genes on or turning these genes off. And it's a specific class of transcription factor that's called homeobox, which was originally named for homeotic mutations in fruit flies, but it's now known that there are many, many types of homeobox genes, and it's more of a, a, a domain of a protein that's conserved. And knotted is a member of the tail homeobox um, family, tail three amino acid loop, not very interesting nickname, but all of these genes in this picture have um, these three extra amino acids and they're conserved across all the eukaryotes. And we, I just told you the function of some of the Knox genes on the far left. In fungi, some of these genes regulate mating type and in animals, they regulate proximal distal patterning in um, limbs. So I think it's fairly safe to say that in general, this is a class of transcription factors that regulate cell fate. And, and one more point that's interesting is that these proteins dimerize um, in a conserved way across the eukaryotes, and that's also true in plants. So uh, Knox genes um, are transcription factors and therefore likely to regulate many genes. We now know they have hundreds and hundreds of targets. And through one-by-one one guesses and also now by whole genome methods, we know that they regulate three of the major plant hormones. And I don't have time to tell you about these hormones, but they regulate things like fruit ripening, um, shoot growth, height, uh, divisions, uh, pretty much everything. And oxen, I think if there's a morphogen in plants, it's oxen. So we know directly that knotted regulates the GA pathway. It turns off GO, GA biosynthesis, and it turns on GA catabolism. And I think that's important because when you think about the meristem, you don't want it to elongate, and you also want to increase the divisions in the meristem. And once you go into uh, a leaf, then you want elongation. So regulating the GA pathway makes a lot of sense, and um, regulating cytokinin as well as auxin. So I've addressed my first question. I'll move on to a second question that I have. And so my first question was, how does a cell know that it's leaf or meristem? And Knox genes are at least one of the answers. And there are many others. And one of the other people in Dr. Detlef Weigel has many, many other answers to this same question. But I'm going to bring up another one that um, I find interesting. And that is, how does a meristem know when to stop? And maybe this is related to the cancer question. And I use the term indeterminate and determinate to think about this question. So you can see the uh, Romanesco broccoli. This is an example of an indeterminate meristem that meristems are making meristems are making meristems, and they never stop, whereas at the bottom is a flower. And the flower results from a floral meristem that makes a number of petals, sepals, uh, stamens, and stops with a carpel, and then it's over. So in order to figure out these kinds of genes in maize, we looked for mutants that have more branches. And you're all familiar with an ear of corn on the far left, the nice, neat rose. And next to it is a Ramosa mutant uh, found in 1910 or 1920. And in this case, there it's quite branchy and busy and not as neatly compacted, not very good for combines. And to understand the defect in more detail, we can look at the scanning EM, where we see here these rows of meristem, there's an apical meristem at the very tip that gives rise to all these lateral meristems, and each lateral meristem becomes a kernel in wild-type maize. In the mutant maize, each lateral meristem often stays on as a meristem and becomes a branch, and so it stays quite branchy. And using those words, determinate and indeterminate, I can, I can say that the very tip is indeterminate. These are determinate meristems, and these are mutated so that what was determinate is now indeterminate. We cloned this gene by position and found that it is expressed in these very meristems. And in fact, it predicts where the meristems will form. And so even at very early stages, at the tip of the um, groin shoot apical meristem, we see expression in this very defined punctate pattern that stays on as the meristem starts to bulge out and then goes away. So it is marking the meristems um, it, before they form and with them as they begin to form and then goes away. And we think it goes away because its job is done, because somehow it's passed on a signal that this meristem is to be limited and not continue to grow and grow. Because the mutant phenotype, the meristems grow and grow. 
We also isolated the gene from a number of other grasses, and to remind you that maize is a grass, one of the many grasses that have been cultivated into crops. And so this pattern of expression and the gene itself is conserved across these grasses, going from rice to wheat to sorghum and maize. And so it's doing something very similar in all these species. That's not true for another gene that also has the name Ramosa, but this is Ramosa 1. Ramosa 1 is highly branched. You can see that each kernel is now a fractal meristem, a branching structure itself. It's expressed later developmentally, not at the very tip of the developing ear, but a little bit later, again in a punctate pattern. And work done with my colleague Eric Volbrecht, who cloned this gene, we know that our gene, Ramosa 2, is upstream of their gene, Ramosa 1. So the gene that I talked about first is regulating this gene. And when you look, when Eric has looked in other grasses, this gene is not found as broadly. It's not found in rice, which is a sequence genome. It's not found in Brachypodium, which is another sequence genome in the wheat group. But it is found in sorghum, which is a relative of maize. So it's a unique transcription factor that's localized in the sort of recently evolved 10 million year group of grasses. So I want to summarize by saying that these morphological mutants have given us clues as to some of the genetic regulators that change morphology, whether it's branches or dissected leaves, and have given us a lot of fruit for interesting discussions. Knotted, which I started with, is conserved across all eukaryotes and found doing a number of things, but at least in, to put it in one word, it organizes cell fate in plants. It's needed in the meristem, and it sets up axes that give you these interesting morphologies. Ramosa 2, a lob domain gene, is found only in plants, and so it's sort of unique to a subgroup of organisms, and it seems to be telling the lateral meristems when to stop, and maybe lateral meristems are unique to plants, so that's why it's not doing this job in animals. And then becoming even more narrow is Ramosa 1, which is found in a very unique group of grasses, maize, and its 10 million year old relatives. And this is the type of gene that evolutionary biologists are interested in because perhaps it's responsible for the unique architecture of this group of grasses. So I'll end here and thank the members of my lab who would, I would not be standing here without them, the many, many graduate students and postdocs who have helped, and these are not everybody, but the ones who are most important. And I've mentioned some of their work, so I want to remark on them, particularly Neela Masinha, who was at UC Davis, who talked about, worked on tomato, Angela Hay, who works on kadamine, who's at Oxford, Eric Volbrecht, who's at Iowa State, and I talked about his work in Ramosa 1. And I'd like to thank my family, they're all here, and I appreciate their support in coming all this way, numerous colleagues and various funders. So I'll take any questions, if you have them. Thank you.